So hello and welcome to the video. Now British Airways. If you live in London in the South East you probably don't spend much time thinking about that name but if you live anywhere else in Britain or indeed in Northern Ireland that name British Airways can sometimes be a little bit triggering. It has been some years since BA offered an international service out of anywhere other than London so people living in the provinces have taken to calling BA London Airways because it has such a South Eastern centric focus. Now I strive for accuracy in my video so I must point out that BA's subsidiary City Flyer does now offer a handful of international flights from the provinces where it uses the aircraft that would otherwise be sitting idle at London City during its weekend curfew and that's the reason why airlines like Air France, KLM and Lufthansa do so well in the British provinces because if you're going to have to connect with London to get anywhere you might as well connect in Paris, Amsterdam or Frankfurt and indeed those connection experiences may be better than London Heathrow they may be worse as well but at least you've got the choice. So today I'm taking one of those feeder flights down to London Heathrow from Manchester and as it's only a 150 mile flight it's actually BA's shortest flight. Asterisk, I'll come back to that in a second and it's a flight that really shouldn't exist it's not a long enough route where air travel should really make sense but for two reasons it does exist. The first is the need to feed passengers into BA's terminals in London and secondly Britain's rail network is so terrible it actually takes far longer to cover that distance than it really ought to. Now I said asterisk because BA does actually have a couple of shorter flights their fifth freedom add-on flights to longer routes so Antigua to St Kitts I believe is only 60 or so miles and although I don't think it's returned since the you know what BA also used to fly from Bahrain to Dammam in Saudi Arabia which is only about 30 miles but this is the shortest flight that is actually bookable as a standalone ticket. Now Manchester Airport has a reputation for being terrible so I am prepared to put myself on the line in the pursuit of consumer advice to you dear viewer by travelling through Manchester Airport on British Airways shortest flight asterisk from Manchester down to London Heathrow. And for some reason I've booked myself into business. Well there's no service in economy anyway, it's only going to be about a 30 minute flight so I'm actually quite interested to see what sort of service they can offer in the business cabin on such a short flight. So if you'd like to see what the whole experience is like, stick around. Hi, I'm Matt. I've lived in five countries on four continents. I've flown over 1.4 million miles. I've visited over a hundred countries, every American state, but I'm nowhere near done. So subscribe to see where I go next and perhaps get some inspiration for your next trip. I'd arrived into Manchester quite late the night before so had stayed at the Ibis Budget Hotel at the airport which seems to have been built in the Holiday Inn's car park. I'll make a video about the wider trip this flight was part of but I'd picked the hotel based solely on price without realising it was almost a miles walk away from Terminal 3 where BA for some reason chooses to operate. You walk through Terminal 2 to get up to the walkways and this recently transformed terminal looked quite nice, shiny and modern with lovely high ceilings. I've seen it said in other videos that the moving walkways linking the various bits of Manchester Airport never work and they certainly weren't working when I visited. It's a long way from Terminal 2 to 3 even if you have Travelator assistance but it's annoyingly long when the Travelators just sit there motionless taunting you with the assistance they're withholding. It was even more annoying that day as it was really hot and if there was air conditioning that also wasn't working. After a transit through the railway station you're eventually spat out into Terminal 1 which has a very different vibe to Terminal 2 and I believe is slated to close now T2 has been renovated. I've used a few adjectives in this script but here I'm going to go with dingy and uninspiring. But you're still not done, you then have to exit T1 and follow the partially covered walkways to get to T3 which feels like it's been built in the car park of an office building. It probably feels a lot less grim if you're dropped off by car but you'd still have a lengthy walk and that transit through Terminal 1 if you arrive by train. Once you're in Terminal 3 the low ceiling theme continues and you head up to the departures area. Which magazine has ranked this terminal as the worst in all of the UK and it's easy to see why. It's hard to believe this space was designed to be an airport terminal as the check-in desks are so spaced out and are laid out in such a higgledy-piggledy way. 
Quite a queue had formed at the BA desk. I'd actually received a boarding pass for this flight when I'd passed through Heathrow the day before, as it had been within 24 hours of this flight's departure. So I lingered briefly to record the scene before doubling back and heading for the dreaded security channel. Manchester Airport has an appalling reputation for its security, and in that Witch magazine report, the security at Terminal 3 was highlighted as being particularly awful. Horrific and overcrowded were the specific words used, and although it wasn't particularly busy when I went through, the heat and the extreme sensitivity of the scanning machines was a real problem. My bag was selected for further screening, as were a lot others, and as it took a while for my turn for inspection to come around, I was able to count how many bags were being held back. In the 10 or so minutes I had to wait, 60% of bags sent through the scanner were pinged for further investigation. When my turn came, my handy dandy universal plug adapter turned out to be the problem, and it needed to be dug out of my bag and investigated thoroughly. The chap doing it was very pleasant, and I would never question the importance of having thorough security at airports, but that exact plug has been through security screening at over 100 airports on all six continents without once attracting the attention of security guys. And forcing secondary screening of 60% of scan bags is just ridiculous. Every single person I witnessed was cleared to continue after the inspection with nothing untoward having been found in their luggage. But Manchester Airport seems to operate to a different standard to the rest of the UK and the rest of the world, which cannot be right. It was baking hot, and it would have been an absolute nightmare to get through if that level of pettiness is maintained at the busiest times of day. Once I was through, I was in real need of a shower and a lie down in a darkened room, but as I knew that neither of those things would be easy to arrange, I settled for heading to the lounge. I'd seen that the dedicated BA lounge had recently closed, so I headed for the only names lounge that was advertised, which was the Escape Lounge. I followed the Escape Lounge signs out of the lift, but it turns out these signs directed me to the wrong place. This was for priority pass holders and the like. Instead of getting access to the Escape Lounge, I was directed to the Escape Lounge, which was the other side of the lift lobby. How silly of me. There was no BA signage anywhere, but I thought the signage that there was was somewhat unwelcoming. The people in front of me had done the exact opposite of me by going to the escape lounge rather than the escape lounge, the idiots, but my club boarding pass afforded me entry. I was directed through to this overlook area, which was still pretty warm, but at least it wasn't crowded, and after grabbing a couple of pints of water from the bar, I was able to bring my core body temperature back down to within normal operating limits. The lounge itself was okay. The decor was a little underwhelming. Everything felt, well, broken in, let's say. There were a mix of seating options, and even if the interior of the space wasn't brilliant on the eye, there were some good views out over the apron. As for food, there were sandwiches, salads, and hot food drawn mainly from the beige family. It was all respectable enough, though. There was also a decent self-service bar, entry level rather than premium brands on offer, but again, respectable enough. There was a significant Ryanair presence in the terminal, so although Britain's national airline only offers service to London, I was quite impressed by the range of destinations that were available to you. I stayed for an hour or so and left feeling considerably better than I had when I arrived, which I suppose at the end of the day is the effect you want a lounge to have on you back into the body of the terminal, and quite a lot of space was given over to a duty-free shop. Decent prices, although not that much use to Brits heading off on holiday, and no use at all to me flying domestically. The rest of the terminal was not that attractive, with retail crammed in between the gates and a few F&B outlets dotted around, all of which were heaving. A dated space, which I doubt was designed to cope with the volume of passengers now being rammed through it. This was my first departure from Manchester, so I have no idea whether the airside part of T2 is as pleasant as the land side felt, but most full-service airlines operate from there, including Virgin and BA's One World partners Qatar and Cathay Pacific. There must be a reason why BA is sticking with T3, and I have a hunch they do so, as it's the cheapest option for them in Manchester. Our boarding gate was better described as a boarding corridor, very limited seating was available, and it was a very poor experience. 
Imagine if you'd paid thousands of pounds for a first class ticket onwards from Heathrow and this was the first step of your luxurious British Airways journey. It really was very poor. But I sensed that most passengers were regulars on the route so everyone seemed to know what to do and where to go so it was all very orderly. And even though groups 1 to 3 were co-mingled in the queue, group 1 was called forward first and again it was all very orderly. Cramped, crowded and the opposite of the premium experience BA would have you believe you'd bought, but orderly. It turned out to be a status heavy flight as there were a lot of people in group 1. And that hashtag premium not premium experience was further rammed home with some hashtag boarding not boarding action before we were allowed on the plane. That lasted about 6 or 7 minutes but eventually we were cleared to shuffle aboard our 15 year old Airbus A320. I was in row 4 today out of 6 rows of business. I've talked about BA seats plenty of times in the past, but this is the 30 inches of legroom your premium ticket affords you, basically the same as the economy passengers behind you, although in business you do get the middle seat blocked off. So you will have some extra space to stretch out in, provided your body is shaped in a way that allows you to stretch sideways. BA does at least allow you to gobble as much power as your USB cable can consume, although again that's the same in the economy cabin behind you. I made a wager with myself that BA must have acquired this plane from somebody else as it had personal air vents, but I lost that bet as it's been BA's since purchase. Different economic thinking must have prevailed when BA was buying planes 15 years ago. But in learning this I picked up a fascinating glimpse of how BA has densified the seating on these planes over the years. The seat count has increased no less than four times in those 15 years and there's now 20% more seats crammed in than when this airframe was delivered. I did also notice that BA loaded people through the rear across the apron which did speed the process up a little although we were still about a half hour late pushing back and up into a pleasant Manchester afternoon. I said in the intro that I'd gone crazy when booking and had redeemed avios for a seat in business class to see what sort of service they could offer on such a short flight. I paid around 7,000 avios plus 40 quid for this leg which equates to over £100 in total. We were in the air for a total of 34 minutes and the crew were released from their seats about 9 minutes after takeoff. The trolley hit the aisle about 15 minutes in and to give the crew credit they served all of the 20 or so cub passengers inside of around 6 or 7 minutes. And we received an afternoon tea with a choice of fruit or plain scones with a glass of wine. I broke the habit of a lifetime and went for a glass of white. I received my tea at about the exact same time the captain announced our descent and the tray was cleared exactly 7 minutes after I received it. It was a struggle, but I did manage to eat it all, although it was cleared so quickly I have no evidence to prove it. And 34 minutes after takeoff, we landed back into Heathrow. So I wanted to answer two questions with this flight. The first is whether Manchester Airport is as bad as its reputation. Based on this single experience, I have to say yes. Terminal 2 might be delightful, and I'm now quite keen to experience it to see what it's like for myself, but Terminal 3 was downright awful. It's so poorly designed that I'm still not convinced the space was ever actually meant to be an airport. The terrible, overzealous security is so out of line with the approach of other airports that the authorities really should look into it. Rejecting 60% of screened bags is just ridiculous. And the passenger experience through the gate is just poor. Not that I've been through every airport in the UK, but it's clearly the worst of the ones I have and I can't immediately name many overseas airports that are much worse. The second question was whether BA can offer a meaningful service on a 34 minute flight, and they can. You need to be a quick eater and you get a materially different amount of time with your refreshments if you're in row 1 rather than row 6, but you can enjoy an afternoon tea and a glass of wine on that flight, both of which were pretty good by the way. And I suppose the third question was whether paying the premium for a club seat was worth it. That one's easy. Nope. This was a domestic arrival and we deplaned through a domestic gate which allowed me to nip out through this door which I'd never previously noticed. And that's the right end of the terminal for the trains and tubes which is actually quite handy for making a speedy exit. So thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed it. Please give this video a like if you did. And leave me a comment, have I been unfair to Manchester Airport or have I let it off lightly? 
please consider subscribing if you're new. And if you'd like to support what I'm doing more directly, there is a Patreon account, the link to which is in the description below. So thanks again for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one. Goodbye.